Okay, so let's uh, let's get started. Uh, we're happy to have Claudia here today talking about uh, the effects of port development. Claudia, we go for an hour, so take it away. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot for inviting me, and thanks everybody for coming. Um, I have to apologize that uh, my co-authors couldn't make it to be on the chat, um, but I will uh, look at the chat for sure afterwards and also kind of follow up with email if we don't get to talk to. So please um, still use the chat uh, to give us feedback. Uh, we would appreciate it. Thank you. Okay, so this is a paper about ports and um, why, why ports. Um, we think ports are pretty important in our global you know, transport system. Uh, a lot of uh, the vast majority of goods um, travel through seaports at some part, uh, point on their journey. And uh, they have also been named as being really important in order to allow countries to participate in global production networks. So, um, you know, ports are really important for international trade. Um, yet there is the, there, I think compared to, or we think compared to other transport um, infrastructure, they are, they are still a little bit understudied. So um, that's what we wanted to uh, investigate a little bit in this paper, um, trying to think about, you know, what are the economic effects of um, port development? What is happening both um, locally at the, uh, uh, at the, at the um, location of the city and also kind of in the aggregate when ports get developed? And um, well, if you, uh, how, do you, how, do we, how do you think about a, a port city? Well, um, one pretty, I think, standard way to think about it would be that um, port development, developing a port would probably reduce transport costs. Um, it would, this would be good for the city because, because it could um, sell their goods to you know, more markets more cheaply. It could buy uh, inputs more cheaply. Um, so it would definitely be kind of beneficial for this for the port city as such, but it would, would also be good for um, other cities that are using the port city as a, a kind of in, you know, for, as a transportation service. Um, so all of these kind of benefits um, are typically, I think, in the in the literature labeled as, as kind of the market access effect. And we are used to thinking about these in terms of other infrastructure um, development, like roads, railroads, and these sort of things. So this is probably something that we should expect. Um, however, when we started to investigate ports, we um, realized that there is um, another mechanism besides this, uh, you know, beneficial market access mechanism um, that um, speaks a little bit more to kind of the cost side of um, port development. And in this paper, we kind of highlight how the benefit and the cost side um, kind of uh, play together and, and what kind of effects they have uh, on uh, port cities at the local level and um, also on other cities on the, at the aggregate level. So what kind of mechanism is this that speaks more to the cost side of port development? Um, well, one thing that we noticed when we studied the literature on ports um, um, is that the modern uh, ports tend to be very land intensive. So they use up a large um, um, area, uh, a large, large spatial, spatial area. Um, if you want to put a picture into your uh, mind, uh, think about container ports where containers are typically spread over relatively large areas. Um, you can go now actually if you want on Google Maps and kind of zoom into uh, the satellite, satellite picture of a port of your choice and you will see kind of these uh, boxes uh, um, kind of spread out. I've, I've done that and I've seen that. And um, well, if uh, uh, technology, if port development is land intensive, this could lead to a crowding out of alternative uses of that land at the local level, at the level of the city, because land is the ultimate locally scarce resource and um, there's opportunity cost of, losing, of using the land for port versus for other economic uses. So this is um, the mechanism that we're going to call a crowding out mechanism. And that's what we are going to um, kind of uh, focus on in, in this paper. Um, more specifically, we are going to um, show that this um, crowding out mechanism is empirically relevant. So it is important to explain some patterns in the data. And we are going to use um, the introduction of containerization to show this because containerization once we read up on, on this, um, we realized there's a technology that did increase the land requirements at the port. So that's precisely this uh, technology that, that makes um, ports more land intensive and, um, and brings this mechanism to, to work. So, um, you, so, it's in, uh, so this uh, mechanism is important to account for certain patterns in the data, but it also has um, in, uh, important uh, effects at the, at the level of the city and then on the aggregate. And it also affects on how we should think about um, welfare gains from containerization is distributed across countries. So this is kind of the overview in a nutshell. 
And um, a bit more specifically, I'm going to talk today um, about three um, parts of the paper um, to, to explain how we tackle this issue. So in the first um, part of the paper, this is uh, our reduced form part of the paper, we are going to estimate the um, effects of containerization on uh, the population of the port city. Um, and um, ex ante, if you're just thinking about the market access effect, you would probably expect, oh, containerization lowers transport cost, um, the city can access more markets, both input for inputs and outputs, and that probably should have a positive effect on population, at least with other transportation technologies we, we, uh, people have found this. But um, what really surprised us is if we estimate this in the data here for, for, for ports, um, we find actually that there is um, zero um, effects on population. So there's no net benefits um, of containerization on a population. And this is really what got us thinking about um, kind of what mechanism could offset this um, market access mechanism, these benefits from market access that we typically think about. And then a second clue um, towards um, how to think about this was when we looked at um, heterogeneity and when we looked at um, which um, port cities increased their shipping um, in a response to the containerization shock. And we find uh, that the, uh, there is heterogeneity in terms of how, um, how large the land prices, the land rents in cities are more important, more specifically, um, cities with low land rents increased shipping by um, more. Um, so this kind of um, uh, can be explained with our crowding out mechanism because in these cities the opportunity cost of land is lower, so this crowding out um, effect is uh, less less important. So our this crowding out mechanism is is uh, can it is consistent with these two um, stylized facts that we show in the data. I'm going to show you details on this. Um, so this is just the, the sorry you here, but feel free to already help in with questions. Um, yeah. Go ahead. So the first the bullet point is a non-finding, right? Yes. I've always thought of those uh, uh, population mobility models as very long-term. Mm -hmm. So it's very hard to identify anything. Yeah. Um, from the uh, effect of other shocks. So yeah. how do we think about that? Do we think about it as really being zero effect and there is an offsetting effect or is it just not identified? So um, we, um, as, as you'll see, um, our data is pretty long term. So we have decadal data and we, uh, we have um, uh, data on kind of up to 30 years after a containerization shock, by which time you probably would think that something would happen. Um, uh, in terms like of other the, shocks. Sorry? Like other shocks, for example. Um, so that, that's then an issue about our identification, which we can talk about more when I, when I explain that. Um, but um, we estimate it in both kind of a panel regression. We look at it, how it develops over time. Uh, we do the long difference. Um, we do different uh, vari variations. Um, the effects are typically kind of around zero and small in magnitude. Sometimes they are negative, but always kind of smaller in magnitude than other papers in the literature have found for kind of roads, roads or railways or other kind of shocks. So this kind of was something that, that surprised us. Um, so, um, but I'm going to tell you details on this in just um, a few minutes, um, just to see where we are going. We are then going to um, try to estimate the uh, welfare effects of containerization by um, using a, a quantitative spatial model that um, features um, this um, crowding out mechanism, but more kind of broadly endogenous port development. So it's basically a standard um, spatial model of trade where we endogenize the transport sector, more specifically the port sector. And we are going to this, this endogenize, but uh, in, in, we are basically allowing ports to decide, port cities to decide by how much to develop their ports. And there will be benefits to port development by you know, having market access and there will be costs to it, which is the crowding out effect. Um, we, what we'll find from this um, exercise is that, um, that this um, kind of resource cost of port development are actually quite sub, a quite substantial part of um, welfare gains that you would not capture if you didn't um, think about endo endogenous port development. But um, because um, different cities um, are going to um, decide to develop their port, they are um, partially, about half of it is going to be offset by, um, by reallocation um, to uh, lower rent um, cities. 
And then finally, we're going to explore some heterogeneity in the welfare effects and find that um, it's mostly um, kind of poor countries in the world that have gained more from this containerization through uh, this mechanism because they were uh, kind of initially um, uh, more poorly located, the land rents were lower, so there was more uh, potential to gain here. So there was distributional um, consequences. So this is the overview, but now let me uh, go into the um, details. Uh, sorry about the, just very quickly on the literature. Um, we just want to highlight that traditionally this uh, literature has mostly thought about the, the benefits to transport infrastructure, um, which I've already highlighted to the agglomeration benef benefits. We stress the cost side here as well. And in that respect, we are um, at a very high level related to this um, uh, literature on the Dutch GCs, where there is negative spillovers between two, uh, across two industries with, within a city. So at a high level, you can think about our um, thinking that there is a, a city with two sectors as a manufacturing sector and the transport sector, there is um, positive spillover effects from the transport sector onto the manufacturing sector because the transport sector provides transportation services. But then the on the cost side, there is a competition um, for um, you know, a, a locally scarce resource where there is kind of negative spillover effects. And then of course, in that um, we, we um, kind of um, add to the, the literature on transport infrastructure, especially uh, onto the one um, where a trade cost is starting to be endogenized. Um, I'll start with um, explaining a little bit about containerization technology, more specifically our reading um, uh, from uh, books uh, uh, describing what's happening in containerization. And I'm especially focusing on things that are relevant for um, our paper, but um, please, please feel free to ask questions if you're thinking about other things. So as you probably know, the big thing about containerization was um, that um, it was uh, that before containerization, um, individual items were handled individually um, when loaded and uh, onto and off ships. Um, and the big innovation was let's put all these things into a box and just handle the box. Um, so you switched from handling um, items of all, all sorts of different so um, sizes and shapes uh, into handling a box and the technology took off when the size of the box um, was um, internationally standardized because then really kind of the whole world um, um, started to, uh, ports across the whole world started to adopt this and this happened at the end of the 1960s. Um, this uh, made it possible to dramatically reduce turnaround times of ships. Um, there's uh, you know lots of uh, estimates in the literature by how much but typically um, you read something that um, it took uh, many days, if not weeks, to unload a ship or load a ship um, before containerization. And afterwards, it was a matter of one or two days. By now, it's even faster, but um, we kind of study here the initial uh, um, wave of containerization when it, when it happened. I've seen um, estimates in the literature ranging between 70 and 95% in terms of the reduction in turnaround times um, of ships. So um, this reduction in turnaround times led to a reduction in um, transshipment costs. So we are going to use the word transshipment cost for all the costs that are incurred um, when uh, you change a mode of transportation. So between land transport and sea transport, but also between um, ships when you move from one ship to another ship at the port. So whenever you go through a port, and um, the main uh, kind of mechanisms that have been, has been stressed in this literature is that um, because um, the ships um, did not have to spend so much time laying idle in the ports uh, waiting to be on, uh, unloaded and loaded, um, they could be utilized uh, much more. There is some esti estimates that um, ships before containerization spend about two thirds of their time uh, just hanging, laying idle in ports and now they are kind of utilized much better. This then later on let um, um, incentivized the investment into larger um, ships. And, and because of there's economies of scale and containerization, this reduced transshipment cost further. And then a second um, uh, mechanism that is stressed in that literature is that also because you are uh, as, a, as a consumer or as a firm, um, it is faster for you to um, uh, kind of get your hand onto the good that is on the ship. Um, it doesn't, uh, there's less capital tied up in inventory. Um, so this is all about transshipment costs, so the 
part of um, transport costs that is incurred at ports. And these actually accounted for a very large share of total transport costs before containerization. I've seen estimates that, um, for example, for a journey from the US to Europe, about um, half of it used to be um, transshipment cost rather than kind of um, a distance-based um, transport cost. Um, um, so, however, this all uh, didn't come entirely for free. Um, in order to realize these cost reduction, in order to really utilize this faster unloading and loading, um, ports needed to um, uh, prepare more, uh, uh, provide more land for each ship that um, is birthed. There is a couple of um, uh, um, there's there's a couple of quotes in the literature that illustrate this, but um, what you basically see is. Um, if I can give you a short history of port design, that ports changed their design. So um, just as a broad overview, historically, um, ports were designed as finger piers. So here is a picture of Manhattan that very famously um, had this design, and that maximized the number of ships that could dock um, uh, on a city at a given point in time. Usually you had a finger um, into the sea and to the left and to the right there was a ship um, berth, and it kind of hang, hung out there for weeks uh, waiting to be unloaded and loaded. Then, even before containerization, um, there was um, continuous technological improvements in automation. So um, mechanized cranes started to be used more. And these sort of, uh, there's a couple of examples in this sort of technology that made unloading and loading faster. And we can see in the um, annual reports of port authorities that they realized that there is actually a trade-off between this uh, space, um, these, these, these time savings, uh, sorry, the speed, the time savings, but also uh, but, uh, space that you need to provide at the port. And initially, because they were not um, kind of that huge improvements, they just made the fingers wider um, in order to uh, uh, um, uh, um, allow for uh, provide more space at the, at, the, at the ship for each ship. However, then containerization came and that dramatically accelerated this uh, speed of unloading and loading and therefore dramatically accelerated this speed, space and speed um, trade off. And there, um, and so mod and on modern ports, what you often can see is that ships are no longer parked as a kind of a finger into the sea, but more kind of adjacent to the coastline. And there's kind of lots of hinterland um, allocated to each ship where you kind of um, uh, spread out these containers. We found a lot of uh, kind of we, we went a lot through um, annual reports of port authorities to understand how ports were thinking about it at that time. And a lot of them mentioned how um, kind of finger piers were not adequate and you needed to provide more space to each ship. Um, in order to kind of try to quantify this a bit, this turned out to be really difficult. But um, for one um, port, we found really good documentation in uh, these um, uh, annual reports. This is New Orleans. Um, because they actually provided uh, provided data on the space that they um, utilized. And we are normalizing this here on the chart per wharf frontage, which is basically the um, which is basically a measure of ships that you can accommodate at a given point in time. And you can see how that increased um, by a lot. I think it went up by like 70, 80% or something like this. And the timing here um, coincides uh, with uh, in the annual report when they mentioned that they are container, that they are introducing container terminals. There's this uh, large increase in um, kind of land requirement. Okay, can, can I ask just a couple of questions? Um, Go ahead. So, I mean, obviously, you know, we look at that picture of Manhattan and we saw all those, those births <laughs> and now those births are replaced by, um, I don't know, um, um, like uh, more parks, kind of, um, parks and mm -hmm. other things. So is, is kind of like the area per wharf frontage the right measure or should it just be like the, you know, the amount of uh, frontage that's, I mean, it seems like the land. Okay. Right so you're talking about relocation, I think. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to get at later. So I'm saying like the technological change is this kind of area per front pitch, but then of course endogenously, and that's really our paper, yep. endogenously different cities decide on whether they want to have um, ports in their city or whether they want to uh, move them um, kind of outside of the city as happened in the case of Manhattan. And, and that's kind of um, then the mechanism. Yeah, but I guess the other thing I wanted to just ask about was, I mean, everything was about, I mean, it was all, it was all about inventories, right? It was really how quickly could you um, use these ships or, or how, you know, so how are you thinking about like the capital labor, the increase in the capital labor ratio for the whole economy coming from 
you know, not having to have like underutilized capital. Is that something you're going to be able to account for? So we are thinking about this in a relatively reduced form way by a reduction in uh, the transshipment cost that um, uh, kind of then, uh, you know, producers or consumers that are utilizing the port um, are uh, benefiting from. But, I mean, it, it just seems like, you know, not the, you need half as many ships if, if everyone can kind of, um, you know, be unloaded, you know, so much faster. And so I, I just, I guess I didn't, I wasn't quite sure of like the general equilibrium side of that. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm, I'm going to show you kind of how we incorporate it into the model, kind of what production function we are going to use. So just to take that away, we are not going to have capital. We are going to think um, uh, of it as a kind of um, that if you invest more land, you're going to um, reduce the, trans, uh, the transshipment cost and there's economies of scale. So the more you do that, the more you um, benefit. Um, so we were thinking of kind of, and I admit this is kind of a stylus reduced form way of thinking that there's, econ there's economies of scale and that's kind of the function that traces this. Um, okay. But we are very uh, open to uh, kind of thinking a bit yeah, more. No, it, just, it just seems like you're freeing up a lot of capital for, you know, just like you're taking more land, you're freeing up a lot of capital for the rest of the economy uh, by, mm -hmm. by you know, using, utilizing it much better. I see, I see. Yeah, it's something to explore um, as a, that we should we should think. And about. I think it's important to endogenize the, the yeah. trade costs. Um, but yeah, okay. We Thank haven't you. thought about this aspect of it. Thanks a lot. I'll I'll take a note. Just to note that going along with the whole you know technological thing, there's there's all economizing on labor, labor, um, and you know that that's the machines can't go go on strike. There's like a like a whole other thing going on there as well. Yeah, so um. Uh, so this technology was also kind of um, labor saving. We decided um, not to put this into the core of the paper and uh, we have had a lot of discussions about this. Um, so um, we'll, we'll see how is your reaction to this. The, the, the main reason is that um, we, I'm going to show you the stylized sex flex in a second, but the main reason is that um, kind of the labor saving aspect of it um, does not explain our stylized facts. And we wanted to find out which mechanism explains this kind of zero net benefits. And that's kind of what we put into the, the center stage of the uh, paper. We then kind of, we have an, an appendix where we allow also for labor, we haven't calibrated that yet, but we kind of also not, in order not to make things too complex, we wanted to find, just focus on this specific mechanism here in this paper. Okay, so um, kind of that leads me to the to showing you actually the stylized facts that we um, want to explain. Um, the but let me start by saying which data we are using. Um, what um, we are using, uh, what we think is is cool, is that we're using a worldwide data set um, of data on um, cities across the globe that are covering precisely that uh, time period when globalization, uh, when containerization happened between 1950 and 1990 at, um, each, uh, uh, at each decade. Um, uh, and the main variables that we um, collected and are going to analyze um, for each city is um, population and shipping. Um, so the ship movements are the real kind of novel part that I don't think have been used in, in, in the economics um, literature before. Um, this is from our um, co-author, an economic geographer, Cesar Ducre, who uh, digitized um, the, the publication Deloitte's List, which is a publication that for the past 150 years has tracked um, ship movements from port to port across the globe. He digitized uh, a week of sample per decade. And um, this basically tells us how many ships um, go from port to port, go through a port. Um, this is at a super granular level, at the port level, in order to match it uh, to the population data that we have, um, we had to aggregate ports to um, cities. So um, one city can have several ports, but for the model, we are um, not going to be exploiting um, within um, city kind of reallocations or, di or dimensions. Um, what we like about the population data is uh, that it, uh, is, uh, that it uh, tries to keep so it does not consider the administrative boundaries of a city, but instead it tries to um, look at the kind of uh, economic agglomeration uh, unit of a city. So some of these cities can be relatively large. So for example, New York um, is bunched together with Newark in uh, this data here because it's kind of one economic uh, agglomeration um, unit. 
um, and it tries to keep that constant over time. The downside is that this data here, pop, uh, the population data stops in 1990. So we are really only able to look at the first wave of containerization. I know that you'll probably have uh, uh, in mind kind of more recent developments in containerization and especially with IT and that sort of stuff. And I'm sure that has happened and is important, but with that data, we are just looking at kind of this first wave. Once we allocate these ports to the cities in our um, data, we end up with 553 port cities and the stylized facts are mainly going to be about port cities. For the model, we're also going to use the inland cities because they are able to be, uh, they are going to be able to use transportation and um, services through the port cities, obviously. Um, and one downside that I uh, just want to be upfront um, about is that um, while we like that this data is very granular at the geographical level and covers this large time period, um, we are only able to count ships. We don't have the ship volume or the shipping value. So that's, you know, of course, uh, not ideal. For the uh, quantitative exercise, we're going to um, use a calibration to translate that into shipping values. Um, for the reduced form evidence, um, we, we, we're just going to use the ships. Um, so, but we are not going to use a specific kind of elasticity from the reduced form uh, fact to, in our model. Excuse me. Do you know yes. if there are container ships or tankers or dry bulk? Um, no, so uh, yes, I should have mentioned that. Um, so this is um, sh all ships. Um, we cannot distinguish which are container ships and which is not. And um, Actually, uh, we also had a, a quite a discussion about this. Um, I'm talking a lot about containerization, but when you read about the literature, it turns out that some of these um, economies of scale effects at the port level might have spilled over onto other uh, cargo as well. So at first we thought, is this a bug or a feature? Um, now, given that our um, shipping data is, uh, sh uh, is kind of ships overall, we um, at, at earlier versions of the talk, we actually called uh, this not just containerization, but new port technologies. So we are thinking about a bundle of um, technologies that's changed with containerization. Some might have spilled over onto other um, freight and we are taking kind of the, the, the whole bundle. I mean, I think you, I think that interpretation actually probably is more fruitful in that there are a number of innovations in bulk handling that kind of, they, they predate uh, containerization, but um, especially in dry bulk. There's mm -hmm. big innovations in the early 60s. Mm -hmm. and, and then there's also innovations in the ship side with the remote control of the engines and things like that, which allowed for much bigger ships. Mm -hmm. So there's a bunch of stuff going on in the industry. Everyone gets all worked up about containers. Um, yeah. But there's probably a bigger impact from dry bulk, at least initially. And so, so I, I, I would argue for <laughs> the interpretation you had before. I'm glad that you that you say that, even though I should answer a response to this, that we are going to exploit the timing of the containerization um, shock. So we are not going to, and I'll maybe I'll just show you this in a second. So it's going to be kind of technologies that come at the same time as, to, as containerization came in. So we, we're thinking about kind of this kind of spillover, spillover effects. So, but this will become clear, I think, um, now. Um, so we started out with kind of um, trying to estimate as very typical in this literature, you know, what are the benefits of or expecting there to see kind of big benefits of containerization by regressing, regressing the population um, of, a, of a port city on a measure of uh, kind of the shipping activity here in our case, the number of ships. Um, of course, um, uh, shipping is, is an endogenous variable. And we want to um, tease out the kind of change that comes um, due to containerization. And we are following here um, earlier literature that um, highlighted that um, because containerization um, made it possible to make ships larger and deeper, um, the naturally endowed depth at the port um, is, a good, is a good measure of a city's suitability for really embracing containerization at a, at a scale. Um, so once we, um, we, we thought about this, we realized that um, uh, kind of there is one catch to depth, uh, which is you, if you really want to accommodate deep ships, you can just also dig, right? You just dig deeper and accommodate these ships. So um, if you measure depth at the ports um, today, you might actually endogenously measure uh, endogenous outcome. So um, what we are trying, what we, are, what we ended up doing here is um, we're using um, very granular data on oceanic, uh, um, on, on depth in the sea. 
but not at the port, at the, at the location of the port, but uh, kind of in a donut ring around the port to measure um, what is the naturally endowed depth um, at, this, at this port. And here is just to give you a, an idea of what this looks like on two examples, Los Angeles, a deep port that was also successful in containerization and on the right hand side, Buenos Aires, a shallow port that was not so successful in containerization. And we read in industry reports that um, both uh, sites cite um, kind of, or, or quote uh, depth being kind of um, factors in the development. And you can see kind of how we exclude the, the, in the donut ring in the donut hole, basically whatever might be going on right at the location of the port. Um, but um, we do more. We try to. Uh, we're going to try to show you that this actually does not pick up endogenous stretching, and that it also um, passes um, pre-trans checks in the, in the sort uh, in a sense that um, we this this uh, kind of variation does not pick up things that are happening before containerization took place. So let me show you this. Um, once um, you actually look at nautical um, maps um, of ports, so this is what uh, captains use um, to, um, you know, um, 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 steer their ships. Here is the example of Buenos Aires, the shallow, shallow port. Um, this is what dredging looks like. It looks like these white channels that um, kind of go from deeper seas into the port. And um, so um, the question is, um, does our measure of uh, depth pick up dredging or not? We had an RA um, go through 100 uh, randomly selected ports in our sample, look at these nautical maps and indicate whether um, they, they can see um, dredging on the map or not. And then we checked um, whether our depth measure is correlated um, with, uh, with this uh, dredging dummy. And, um, well, what we see, so if you would think that our depth measure is still um, endogenously capturing dredging, you would expect to see a positive coefficient, but here it's a negative coefficient, if anything. And that's um, very natural because at more shallower ports, there is more um, dredging. So this um, basically confirms that um, our measure of depth captures the naturally endowed part of depth and not um, kind of the endogenously dredged um, uh, depth. Um, so, uh, there's one, uh, so this is our measure of depth. We check um, how is it correlated with, um, ex, uh, with um, the level of shipping and population in the beginning of our sample in 1950, as well as um, changes in shipping and population in columns three and four before containerization, so between 1950 and 1960. And you see um, uh, something that kind of surprised us that um, depth is actually um, correlated with um, changes in um, population before um, containerization. Um, uh, so uh, it's, it seemed like that the story was, which we didn't know ex ante, but um, that um, larger ports, uh, larger cities um, uh, uh, were historically more likely to be located at um, kind of river basins, which are shallower, and um, they grew slower. So what we actually ended up using in the a paper is a residualized measure of depth where we residualized depth on population in 1950. And this is the second line here. This measure is uncorrelated with um, changes in shipping and population before containerization. Um, to show you this a bit uh, deeper, uh, better, here is how um, shipping reacts to um, our depth measure um, throughout all the decades that we have data for. And we are interpreting 19, then the coefficient of 1960 as a mesh, as a kind of pre-trends check and um, whether the timing coincides with when containerization um, took off, which was um, at the end of the 1960s, beginning of the 1970s. So you can see in 1960, um, there is um, still uh, no effect of depth on shipping growth, but afterwards um, you see a, um, this significant effect. For our um, regression, I'm going to pull the years between 1970 and 1990 together, which you see in column five, and that's going to be our instrument in order to estimate the, uh, the um, effect of shipping on population. And this is what you see here on the next slide. Um, so column one is OLS, and in column two, we have the instrument. Is there a question? I don't know if there was, but I'll ask one. Can you tell us the magnitude about those coefficients seem to very large? So, but so I don't know how in meters yeah. is the depth measured? What is it? So the set in the so in the second line here, um, we standardize the coefficients. So in the second line, 
um, uh, this is in, in terms of standard deviation. So one standard deviation in shipping increases um, population by 0.03 standard deviation. And this is what we compare to other estimates in the literature that I mentioned earlier, um, where people found a, a magnitude of a, a by magnitude of a order of magnitude larger effects. Um, if we do this in the in long differences, um, you see a similar thing here. Actually, um, the um, IV estimate um, is um, half of the OLS estimate. Um, if we do different specifications, controlling for different things, um, these estimates tend to be in this uh, kind of hover around zero. Sometimes they are negative, sometimes they are positive, but they are always um, uh, uh, economically small. Um, so then we started to think about, you know, what, what can explain th this and, and started to think about whether this crowding out of, um, mechanism could explain this. And um, here um, in the data basically we wanted to test um, for heterogeneity. So um, this, the first stage here, um, deep cities after 1970s that increased shipping, um, is there heterogeneous effects in what types of cities um, do so? And by interacting it is with a measure of land rents. So um, it was impossible for us um, to get a measure of land rents in 1950 for all cities in the world, probably unsurprisingly. Um, but we realized that there is a paper by, um, um, by researcher at MIT size um, who shows that, um, who constructed a geographic measure of, um, bill, um, uh, of, of um, Kind of uh, ruggedness of the on the of the overland um, that is correlated with land rent. That is a, a kind of a proxy for land rents. And the advantages of this measure is that it is um, kind of exogenous because it's determined by geography, and also that we can easily construct it for all cities in the in the world. And that's what we are using here. And um, the chart here shows that um, shipping increased um, for deep cities after 1970s, but uh, especially, but actually only so if the if the land rents in the city were also small. So here on the left hand side, not if the land rents were high. Um, the, uh, there is all we uh, uh, there is also some uh, I think um, uh, uh, we 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 kind of mentioned that a little bit before. There, there is also some a reallocation of ports um, within uh, going on within cities. Um, we are, um, so here on the left uh, hand side, I, am, I show you the, um, the distance of the geocode of the port to the geocode of the city center, um, much before containerization and much after. So we only digitized two um, uh, port uh, index yearbooks for, for this exercise. And you can see that um, for the left graph is for existing um, ports, for existing ports, um, uh, ports move, uh, expand toward away from the city center. And the picture is even more striking on the right, where we just look at uh, kind of uh, new ports, new ports that are uh, added to a city. These tend to be uh, um, built at the outskirts of a city on average about um, 10 uh, kilometers, I think, not miles um, away from the city center. So this is again something that is consistent with um, uh, land rents because land rents tend to be high at the city center. It is kind of consistent with a crowding out mechanism. In the model, we are not going to um, use um, uh, mobi uh, mobility within cities, just across cities, but I just wanted to show you that th this is also um, going on in the data. Um, okay, so um, the, in the next step of the uh, presentation, we are now trying to um, put uh, endogenous port development into a model of- oh, yeah. just, a, just a quick anyway. question on that, that last statement, that these things moved out because of land rents. I mean, the <clears throat> ports were very labor intensive, right? And, and often we, we locate, um, you know, places near workers. Um, and so containerization, is it clear that it's, it's the land rents or is it just the, the lack of need uh, to be close to workers? So, so when we thought about this, we thought about this, uh, the question that came uh, up earlier by Dorian, um, kind of um, what would you expect to happen if um, uh, if if you just think about the um, kind of the reduction in labor intensity, high land rent cities, kind of city center tends to be where or I mean to be honest we thought about it more across cities. So high land rent cities tend to be where wages are large. So if you are able with this technology to save on labor, you actually would be less likely to re reallocate. So that's kind of how we thought about it. That um, 
that uh, kind of this correlation with land rents um, is more consistent with kind of using um, higher use of land intensity rather than a lower use of, of, of labor. So I don't know where within a city where the labor would be <laughs> located. Um, but in any case, containerization did use less labor. So I don't know. Yeah, I, just, I just wonder if there's some way of using like the transportation infrastructure to, uh, you know, like, is there a good, you know, way of moving people around within the city to help you identify the land channel versus the worker channel or something like that? Um, you know, in some sense, if these things are, you know, you need one tenth as many workers, um, it, it's just a, it's a completely different calculation. Yeah, so I'll, ha I'll have to think about it, especially that within city angle, as I said, we kind of were thinking more across um, yeah. um, cities. Um, there's probably more to be done even kind of at the kind of city uh, level. And then did, did you, I mean, um, most of us watched The Wire at some point, and there, there's obviously the endogenous uh, adoption of container technology that's going to be correlated to other, you know, political economy issues in a city. Did you guys do any sort of controls for for those angles? Um, so the controls in our empirical exercises that we used is um, we controlled for um, kind of initial city size, um, a coastline, country, that sort of, so as, as long as you think that, I guess country is the one that would be most correlated with these sort of things. Um, that's the know, thing Baltimore, that's you know, some, you know, some cities are, would be, I mean, you could look at like unionization rates or something like that by like a region or something like that. Okay. I'll, um, you know, I, I don't know what forces are there to kind of push yeah. against uh, adopting new ports or, or whatnot, so. Yeah, okay, well, well, we'll, we'll think about that, thanks. Although for the unions, sorry. Go ahead, Benjamin. No. For, for the unions, like the, in the US at least, the, every port was unionized even in uh, low union density states, so. Texas was all the ports were completely unionized, despite the fact that Texas is not a particularly unionized state. Okay, thanks. Maybe maybe related to that, we're going, I guess we're going to see the whole. But I'm just thinking: Are do we have economizing on the number of ports that you know we get ended up with these mega ports, and you know, you know you're kind of a small small port, but related to other kinds of of technology changes happen at the same time. Uh, we sort of, sort of have some die and, and other words become mega ports. Um, so we are thinking about this um, of more kind of the intensive rather than the extensive margin. So there were some new ports uh, kind of added and some, uh, but but these were these were relatively few. The changes that we see is more expansion of existing ports, and they could be mega ports for sure. Um, but it's not, uh, it's less um, adding new ports, it's more the expansions of existing ports. So in our model, we are going to think about each port city to potentially have a port and the decision will be how large should that port be. So maybe it could be a mega port. <laughs> we'll, we'll, I'll tell you like what the incentives to, make, to have a mega port. Um, well, can I ask another question before you go into the model? Um, you treated land rents as being very different from depth of sea. As you pointed out, you don't really have land rents. You just have the rugness of the terrain. And it seems to me like the two are very similar, right? In order to build a large port that's amenable to containerization, you need both a depth of the ocean and a flat, a large flat area. So why so this are is the interaction the, here. we thinking about them as different things? Right, the interaction shows up. Um, exactly. So why is ruggedness of the terrain about prices and not a precondition for containerization or the lack of ruggedness and the, the depth of the sea is? Mm -hmm. I guess you're not gonna use the, the sea for anything else, but Exactly. Yes. Both seem like a technological concern. So they are, they are, um, they are correlated um, because we are allowing them, kind of, we are, we are <laughs> adding them individually, kind of fully in a fully satiated model. We are allowing each of them to to be relevant here. Um, I guess with our depth measure, given the pre trends and everything, we thought this would be capturing it. Um, That it, yeah, I'll 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 check out <laughs> land rent. I'll just I, I see, wait until I see, what, I see what you what you mean. I guess we were pretty confident that our depth measure would capture that, but it's a good uh, idea to to double check this. 
Yeah. So we are thinking of a kind of by putting both uh, in, even though they are correlated, we are clearly thinking about them having a different economical role. That's that I admit. Yeah. But we should question that. I'm, I agree. Um, so how do we do it in, the, in a model? Um, we are thinking about the world of a kind of a finite number of cities, um, some of them being port cities because they are at, located at the coast and the, the rest uh, being inland. Um, each city um, has a manufacturing sector, produces a city specific good using land and labor. Um, and um, because the good is city specific, there's an incentive to trade, but um, trade is costly. And in our uh, model, we are going to think about the trade cost as um, consisting of three elements. Um, so distance-based land shipping, distance-based sea shipping, and then our kind of the heart of our model is the transshipment cost, which you um, have to pay whenever you um, basically be switch between land and sea shipping or uh, just um, hop on board a ship or switch um, ships. And um, so how, uh, so what explains um, how, how, how much uh, transshipment costs are in a port city? Um, so we are uh, in each port city, we are allowing landowners to allocate a given supply of land between either the production of the city specific goods. So renting, uh, so we are allowing them to rent it out to the manufacturing sector or decide um, to use them for the, the land for port development. So if you are using, um, so we are going to use the word port development as a word for using a larger and larger share of land um, in the port. And that um, is beneficial, as I uh, kind of su uh, suggested earlier, because um, our the transshipment cost is going to uh, allow to, de uh, to depend on the share of land that is allocated to the port as opposed to the manufacturing um, sector. Um, so there, the transshipment costs fall the more um, land um, you allocate to the port and increase. Um, and, um, but on the other side, it's costly because there is a fixed supply of land. So there's opportunity cost of using it at the port because you could be using it in the manufacturing sector. So that's kind of the key um, trade off here. Um, we are uh, thinking, about, so I've just talked just about the endogenous uh, part of transshipment cost, but in the model, we're going to allow for a little bit more um, uh, um, um, form here. So we are also going to allow um, for an exogenous transshipment cost. Um, so this is the new, we are going to allow each port to have an exogenous um, um, transshipment cost. So I think um, some ports are just naturally for some other reason, um, uh, cheap, cheaper for, tra for transshipment than others. The PSI is the endogenous part that depends on the land. And then um, shipping to the power of Lambda, we are also going to allow for um, congestion at the port if there's kind of too much um, shipping uh, going on because we read in some industry reports that, um, that they were concerned about this. But um, in terms of um, magnitudes, when we played around with this, this is not going to uh, play a big role for the paper. Um, how do transshipment cost um, uh, feature in the total um, trade cost of moving something from A to B. Uh, maybe um, just focus here on this line. This is the kind of complete trade cost for moving a good from an inland city R to another inland city S using potentially using ports. So you have to pay a land trend distance based land transport cost um, for moving the good from the inland city R to some port. Then you pay um, transshipment cost um, for moving the good at the port from the land to the ship. And then you um, may ship it to another port and you pay sea, uh, distance based sea transport cost. You can do that multiple times um, switching at different ports. And then when you are at your port of destination, um, you have to pay um, distance based land transport cost to the um, city uh, of destination. So that's kind of the structure of trade cost and that's how the transshipment cost fe um, feature. In, into this um, sum or into the, in this element. So I have to um, be quick here. So I just want to highlight um, um, there is an interesting first order condition for the port city landowners that have to decide how much land to allocate to the manufacturing versus to the port sector. And that's given here. And that uh, kind of f features exactly how we are thinking about this crowding out effect. Um, so um, holding the demand for shipping constant um, this you can think about this as the ma marginal benefits of, allo uh, of allocating um, land to the port. So holding the demand for shipping constant um, in high rent cities, um, this um, you will allocate less um, land to the port. 
uh, but also um, kind of holding rent constant. If there is more demand for shipping, you will allocate more um, land to the port. And this is kind of the, the key um, 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 trade-off um, here. And um, when we then solve the model uh, for equilibrium population of a specific city, um, this um, takes the form that is um, very typical of um, these sort of models. Um, population in a city depends on um, the amenities and the, uh, the, exo the, 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 the um, exogenous amenities and productivities in a city. So these are the, the letter A's. Um, let me skip this for a second. They depend on the market access, which is basically a weighted sum of um, pop a population in all cities weighted by um, 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 transport cost. And you can see how does um, how does uh, port development um, feature here affect population? Well, by lowering transshipment cost, trade cost will be lowered, market access will increase, and um, population um, would increase. So that's the typical market access um, effect. Um, and but now let me go to this term here. Um, here is where our crowding out mechanism features. So by by port, by developing your port, by allocating more land um, to the port. So if F goes up, the land available in the manufacturing sector goes down, and that should um, kind of um, reduce um, the population in the city. So in the next step, um, we are going to um, try to kind of test this relationship in the data by checking. Um, how uh, whether population um, has both this crowding out flavor once we control for market access. So which is basically a, a, a kind of an interpretation of this uh, equilibrium condition that I showed you earlier, uh, before, just on the slide before. So in our model, our model would predict that once you control for market access and market access should have a positive um, coefficient, um, then the remaining effect that, that shipping has on population should be negative because it's capturing the crowd out effect. Um, so we are um, going to estimate this um, equation. We have two endogenous variables, so we need two instruments. So this is really um, hard to, to do. We have one instrument for shipping, which is depth interacted with post 1970s, but we also need a different, a separate instrument for market access and we need different variation for this. Um, what we did is um, we, um, I have to be quite quick here. I'm happy to answer questions about this later, but we um, took um, this um, fi some findings from the urban economics um, literature where um, people showed that in the um, second half of the 20th century, there was a migration towards um, cities with warm winters, um, apparently because of, of air conditioning. And um, so um, people in the literature have shown that frost free number of frost free days is able to predict population in, in, uh, in a city. And that's the variation that we are going to use um, in order to predict population in all cities around the world. And in order to create an instrument for market access that just uses um, changes from uh, uh, in population from um, this uh, kind of um, uh, from this moving to warm winters um, change. We're holding uh, the transport cost here constant at the 1950s level. So if we do um, all of this, um, this would, so in column three there, it's the, it's the, that's the OLS specification. You can see that already in OLS controlling for market access um, reduces the effect of um, shipping on population that was already small to begin with. And now, now it's, it's negatives and small. Once we um, do our instrumentation strategy, it becomes negative and significant, and um, there and uh, market access, as expected, has this positive effect. So, so we take this as evidence that both the market access and the crowding out effect is present in the data, and um, we use this now then um, in order to try to um, very quickly uh, use uh, do some exercises with the model. Um, first, we need to we we um, need to solve um, for the model. We are going to basically invert the model for 1990 in order to solve for everything in the model, and then in the second step, we're going to roll back in time before containerization in order to uh, kind of try to estimate the effects of containerization by undoing containerization. Why do we do it backwards? Um, we need uh, data not only on city population and shipping flows for this exercise, but we need a third vector of uh, variables. Um, so um, more specifically, we need GDP per capita data. And it was impossible for us to get that for 1950. Um, it was possible for us to get it for 1990. 
um, for a subset of um, cities, which we then complemented with data on um, nightlight satellite uh, pictures um, that some people in the economics literature have shown to be correlated with GDP city, uh, at, at kind of very um, disaggregated um, levels of, of, of aggregation. So we're going to do this in order to have um, a worldwide um, city level GDP per capita data for 1990. And once we have these um, three vectors of data, um, using a um, given set of parameters, and we are taking all these parameters from the literature, we can invert uh, the model to recover the fundamentals, which are the amenities at each city, the productivities at each, each city, and the exogenous component of transshipment cost. One thing that we need to specify that is um, not uh, that has not been done in the literature before is um, this transshipment cost function. So, by how much do you um, reduce transshipment cost if you um, develop your port? Um, so that uh, we uh, need to um, um, choose ourselves. And we do that in order to match the observed correlation between um, shipping and port share that we observe in some data points. So I have to say it's extremely hard, um, if we had known that before, it's extremely hard to get um, port area data for cities around this world. Um, so we decided to go for quality rather than quantity and um, managed to find um, really high quality data on this for um, seven ports in the world. And we are going to uh, match this beta parameter um, to the correlation between shipping and port area for these seven ports. Of course, in the paper, we do robustness checks on this, um, but um, here, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get um, more data on, on more ports. Um, these are the parameters from the literature um, about a kind of transport cost and, and other elasticities. And um, now we are able to um, try to estimate the effect of containerization by um, uh, estimating this counterfactual, which is uh, kind of trying to roll back containerization uh, in, in time. Um, we think, of, how do we think about containerization? We think about it as changing two parameters in uh, or, or two elements in the model. One is um, it decreases the land intensity of the transshipment technology. So it, tra it changes this um, transshipment cost function, which we calibrate to um, this one port where we have um, really good data about land usage. And then um, this, uh, so you, you, you change your land intensity, but the benefits of this is to um, get a lower transshipment cost, um, which we calibrate to um, as, uh, industry estimates um, here that talk that talk about um, for the medium port by how much transshipment cost um, has fallen because of containerization. We are also going to allow um, transshipment costs to um, fall more for deep ports um, in line with kind of the narrative that I've told you um, before, but that's not uh, going to be um, um, that important because it's not that uh, the shallow ports cannot handle container ships. They actually um, can by you know dredging this channel. Channel they can just not do it at a scale. Um, this sh shock that we put into the model, um, so to give you a kind of some, some benchmark corresponds to uh, explains about a third of the overall increase in a trade to GDP in world trade to GDP between 1960 and 1990. Um, so about a third of what uh, how uh, of the, how the world trade has been growing is a kind of a, uh, can be attributed to or is, is equivalent to our uh, to the shock that we feed into the model. Um, so then we can solve the model basically before, before and after containerization. And now we check um, whether the model is consistent with the um, reduced form evidence that I showed you before. Um, so it, uh, for, for uh, one thing, it captures this heterogeneity with respect to um, land rents. Um, this is not something that we have targeted, but of course the model mechanism um, in the first order condition that I showed you suggests that this would come out of the model, so it does. And then the second thing is um, that in the, the model also does not um, have any, uh, ben any, any statistically significant benefits um, to um, uh, port development, um, just like in the data. Um, I want to highlight here that this is, in, this is in contrast to a standard model that you would take. So here benchmark one is how we think uh, kind of the standard approach in the literature would be where you just um, think about a trans uh, containerization, reducing transshipment cost exogenously, you feed it into the model, there is no uh, land mechanism, there is no heterogeneity across cities, um, then you would get um, the, just this market access effect, and this would show up as a benefits in terms of population to shipping. So you can see that our model does not feature that 
um, as, as, as does the, the data. So um, from this, um, we estimate the containerization um, the shock that I explained to you, um, increased world welfare by about around 4%. And um, what is very interesting is that this comes, these 4% is actually a combination of three um, different uh, 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 steps. So one is um, you gain from a lowering shipping costs through to, due to containerization. But then a part of this is offset because you need to use land in order to realize the Eastern shipping costs. So that's, a, that's what we call the direct effect. That's the resource cost. Um, but part of this, because ports are endogenously deciding who um, should be developed and, and who should not, there is an indirect effect where part of these direct costs can be offset by different cities specializing in shipping versus non-shipping activities. And we can we disentangle these three effects by estimating different benchmark models that do not feature all of um, uh, these mechanisms that we have in our um, baseline model. So our model here is the, the last bar. Um, the benchmark one here is um, a model where you just um, took transshipment cost as exogenous um, with no uh, use of resources, with no heterogeneity with respect to land rent. Um, then how do you get to our model? Well, one thing is that you um, add uh, land resource cost, and this lowers the welfare gains by about 16%. Um, so this uh, red bar is about 16% um, of, the, of the welfare gains that you started out with. But then, um, but benchmark two um, assumes that there is no, um, uh, that there's just a resource cost, but they're the same for all cities. There's no um, heterogeneity. Once we allow for that, um, you are able to offset more than half of these resource costs by um, specialization uh, across different cities. Um, this is kind of what I what I said, and I know um, I am supposed to finish here. So let me just um, say that um, uh, once we uh, uh, estimate the, uh, we we see that there is quite a lot of um, heterogeneity in the welfare gains across different countries. Some countries gain a lot, and some some countries don't gain very much. And um, these, the gains are correlated with um, um, GDP per capita at the country level. So poorer countries actually um, gain, uh, in our model gained more from containerization. Why is that? Um, we put in the um, kind of some more fundamental drivers um, of, uh, of that also feature in our um, uh, model. And um, there it, uh, you see that um, you can explain why poor countries gained the most because they uh, both um, had a lower uh, productivity to start with, so lower land rents, but also a less favorable a geographic location to begin with. Um, so um, this containerization shock, the lowering of transport transshipment cost, um, helped them to uh, participate in, um, in in trade around the world. I'm sorry, I have I had to be brief here. So let me just um, conclude now. Um, in our in this paper, we um, highlight uh, that for some transport infrastructure developments, um, you should also consider the cost side and not just the benefit side, as is traditional in the literature. And moreover, uh, endogenizing this decision uh, about investing in infrastructure um, can create very interesting heterogeneous patterns uh, that don't, not, not only have a kind of effect, local effects at the level of the city where it takes place, but also aggregate effects because um, ports or, or cities can be undertaking transport services for, for other cities. They're of course all connected. And so we find that um, this um, crowding out mechanism is one thing that can offset um, the positive uh, market access effect, effect at a local level. But at the, at, the, at the aggregate level, it highlights that there can be significant kind of costs to a transport infrastructure development, but um, through specialization, you can gain more. Um, and um, kind of this is more speculative and maybe provoke, provocative also. Um, we uh, see uh, the big port cities of the world, for example, Singapore and Hong Kong, um, you know, having these, these big ports. According to our logic, our model here, um, it made a lot of sense for Singapore to develop their port when they were poor in the 1960s, where land rents were um, low. Um, our model would suggest that um, nowadays when they are uh, kind of rich and they have an industry, a well-developed industry of their own, there may actually be benefits from allowing the ports to, you know, allocate to other places. And in fact, that's something that Singapore is now planning. They're going to um, uh, build a new port kind of farther away from their city um, uh, 
um, in order to free up that um, kind of uh, uh, inf uh, 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 kind of um, real estate uh, in the city. But that's kind of more um, um, speculative. So sorry for uh, taking a couple of minutes more, but I think you said that we do have time for some discussions afterwards. <laughs> We do, in fact. So thank you. Yeah, we'll leave the stream open and start with questions. Paul, you have a hand up? Go ahead. Yes, I noticed, Claudia, you'd mentioned in the list there, Hong Kong. Um, I, f I found your presentation on a macro level very interesting. As it happens, uh, some friends of mine, a family, when they were manufacturing GI Joes in Hong Kong at, during the 60s and the 70s, they noticed that more and more of them were not being shipped out by break bulk cargo but through containerized, fort, uh, containerized freight. They therefore purchased and developed one half of the containerized port of Hong Kong. And as a result of that, and the way their fortunes grew and it benefited their uh, flagship companies, Hutchinson and Chung Kong, it gave them a dominant um, uh, power in manufacturing and distribution in China, which gave, well, I guess, what we would call comparative advantage compared to their competitors in manufacturing development. And, and that's another issue, in fact, that it happens in some of these developing areas. I'm talking about they're doing it in the 1970s, and since then they've been involved in port development around the world as well. But thank you. Thanks a lot for, for telling me this story. Thank mm -hmm. you. So I have, a, I have a question about how much your, I went a bit fast, fast how much the collaboration and therefore the, the that of all of all of the um, the welfare story, story we could have goes beyond uh, the mechanism that you highlighted about land use use. So how much does that rely on this land use story? Because you know we talked talked about these other mechanisms which you know uh, uh, you know you know this new te technology involves shifts. So though there's this revolution in the use of labor, you know shift from labor labor to machines. Um, there's this potentially greater use of use of land. Um, potentially also there are, you know, you know this amenities in terms of safe, safe track. I mean, I spent a year, uh, driving a lot on the New Jersey, Jersey turnpike. And that's not a whole lot of fun when you've got every, everything that are the port of, port of New York trying to cr crush your tiny Volkswagen golf with a huge truck. Um, so there's kind of a lot of, a lot of the amenities associated with these sort of mega, mega contain ports, which. So maybe that shows up in your unity term. Does it really matter that it, it works? Where in collaboration are you relying on this land use thing? Is that something that you're relying a lot on, or could it be something else? I mean, of course, in the in the model, we we um, we just we we kind of put this at the center stage, and what we try to highlight is just kind of how. Um, how, how large these resource costs in terms of land are, and then because of the land the, the land rent heterogeneity, how much kind of endogenous specialization can then offset it. By uh, kind of rolling back the containerization shock, um, we are solving the model for 1990. So we are backing out amenities, um, productivities, and uh, kind of the exogenous transshipment cost for 1990s, and we're holding that constant when we roll back the welfare effect. So if you, um, so everything kind of that's not uh, captured by the model mechanism in terms of population, ship, uh, shipping and GDP per capita, um, that would load onto one of these three fundamentals. So if you were thinking, um, and we have actually thought about kind of this, we could do other counterfactuals where we, on top of our mechanism, also change some other fundamentals or things like that. We haven't done that, um, but that is something that would certainly affect the welfare estimate. Um, uh, the level of it. Um, we are, I guess, not so sure um, whether it would kind of affect this kind of resource cost and then part of it offset by the heterogeneity because that's really very specific to this kind of land rent mechanism. And that's something that we kind of wanted to stress that um, allowing for specialization, endogeneity, you kind of can optimally uh, uh, kind of uh, offset some of some of the resource costs. That's kind of what we wanted to stress. So I don't know. I I guess um, I'm I, I would have to think. But some of these things might affect the level of welfare effects, but not this kind of composition between cost and, and specialization, which we kind of try to to stress more here. I mean, we're not kind of 
trying to argue that this is kind of the complete welfare, the final point, point about kind of the welfare effects of containerization, we found more interesting this kind of specialization pattern in the endogenous reaction. Okay, I have another question on population. So in your model, the best thing that can happen to a city is for a port to be constructed in the neighboring city. Mm -hmm. Right, because then you get all the benefits from exactly uh, the port, market access, but no land cost. Exactly. Does the population increase for those cities? Because it would be nice to have mm -hmm. kind of a more positive yeah. effect on, I, on population I, I, instead I, of just having the negative zero. So in the model, that's exactly true. If we kind of look at the kind of what's happening to nearby cities, I mean, of course. That's not the only determinant because each city will still uh, kind of decide on kind of how, who else in the world can it connect to and the whole kind of network and all of this, right? But on average, this is true. So in the in the model, this is uh, this is true that these kind of nearby cities gain more than the port city. Um, uh, in the there is a related um, paper by um, Leah Brooks and co-authors who estimated and this for just the U.S. Um, but at the kind of larger uh, area, so not at the city level, but at the county level. And they find, um, if I remember correctly, positive effects, whereas we find kind of zero effects at the city level. So um, we do think you would see that, given that we, we try to do some of this, but you know, we don't, we have the world and we'd have, you know, cities, it's, it's just not dense enough to have enough nearby cities to estimate. So we did see kind of this, um, this, uh, this kind of uh, inverse U-shaped pattern so that the nearby ones gain more and then in the effect levels off. But the, because of kind of, we don't have enough cities in all of these distance buckets, um, it's not enough to significantly really kind of pin down this, why, which is why we didn't put it in the paper, but that's the, the intuition is, is absolutely right. So <clears throat> I, um, this, was, this was really interesting and it brings up a lot of, a lot of thoughts for me. Um, so one, one of the things I just, I didn't quite understand was um, you talked so much about land intensity, but it wasn't really, I mean, it seems like these ports are also super capital intensive as well, right? Um, and I mean, on, on the one hand, the first thing I thought about is they're not capital intensive in terms of the ships or, um, or you know, you can move things faster. But on the other hand, like there's a lot of equipment that goes to building the railroads that connect these places, doing the dredging. And, mm -hmm. and so um, it's yeah. really, to think about, I mean, I, I appreciate that you want to have endogenous trade costs, but it seems like <laughs> you want to be accumulating something and then kind of writing down a static model of, of this um, makes it kind of kind of hard um, to think about like the quantitative impact. Um, so um, yeah, I think, I think in, in some sense, we, like, how, how do I want to think about this? I, think I, in, I get I get what you're saying. So I kind of uh, sometimes we wanted to focus a little bit and kind of focus on this mechanism. Yep. So, the one, the, the one thing that this mechanism has is it's about the, the resource that you use is a locally scarce resource, which is what's create the crowding out. Um, yeah. We are thinking of other capital as a kind of a tradable um, resource. So you wouldn't, we wouldn't expect to see the crowding out of, um, mechanism at a kind of local level. That's how but we at, thought at about the local the level, of course, right? I mean, if, if we all adopt this technology, we need a lot more ships or, or we need, we may need more or less ships depending upon elasticity, but we certainly need to build this infrastructure, right? Sure, um, but you can. But ship is a tradable good. <laughs> That's what I meant. You can create. No, no, but the, this is a general equilibrium technology, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the world has to accumulate all of this, you know, the infrastructure to build these these new ports and to provide the ships that you know. Again, I don't know if it increases or decreases. I think it ended up increasing the capital intensity of the shipping sector, probably. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I, I don't know. I guess I was going to kind of say that what you're finding is probably a lower bound on the, the gains, right? Because, um, I mean, there's always a question of, in, in any model with capital accumulation, the long run welfare gains are gonna be bigger, you know, sorry, the, the change in steady states can be much bigger um, because you gave up a lot of resources on the transition. So um, mm -hmm. I, I would probably guess that the welfare, the steady state changes are gonna be 50% bigger than what you're talking about, right? Um, so I, yeah. I guess kind of arguing that they're smaller um, it, it's a little bit hard to, uh, I guess they're smaller in a model that didn't have the What you're but. saying is kind of that there's additional resource cost that we're not incorporating because we're not really only incorporating land cost, right? Which would yeah. reduce the benefits. 
yeah, yeah, there yeah. might be other benefits that we are not modeling, which would increase the benefits. So that's why I'm kind of trying to stress we are we are trying to highlight this mechanism. So another one to give you an example, of one benefit that um, we are not um, modeling here, mainly for clarity, but also because it uh, seemed not to have been taking place immediately, was that um, uh, containerization also reduced the cost of land transport and land uh, mode, switching of mode of transportation between rail and, and road. So this is something that we could um, also feed into the model if we kind of calibrated it to something and then we would estimate a larger welfare effect, for example. We did choose not to do, do this in order to kind of really focus on just this mechanism, but that's an example for something that would give you a larger welfare effect. So I'm really not trying to stress the 4% too much. For us, it's more in, interesting kind of this um, a reallocation, really, but you know that's our. <laughs> our... Then, no, that's fair. I, it just adds something to your point on capital, George, which I think is super interesting. Is that on the other hand, the operating capital that would normally go into having your goods sit at the board for ten days is no, no longer absolutely. there, right? But think yeah, about no. the dynamics is super important, super interesting. I I, I agree. Uh, and then I guess um, the other thing I wanted to sort of ask about was I was sort of surprised that the poor countries gained so much more than everyone else. Because I, I, I thought this technology was somehow, it's like a rich country technology that was kind of pushed on these guys. And uh, it maybe, you know, created, they maybe sort of had to adopt it before they normally would. Um, mm -hmm. And so is, is there, I don't know, it, it just seems like there's, there's always kind of talk about, um, you know, being bypassed by like ships if you don't have the right technology. And, mm -hmm. um, and so it created some sort of network that, um, you know, these guys had to join, but it, not necessarily they would have, they would have, they would have probably preferred the other technologies. Is there anything in your model that could speak to that? So um, this was a technology that was adopted pretty quickly within um, 15 years is uh, Gisela Rua's um, paper. It was pretty much available worldwide, but it was not necessarily adopted at scale everywhere. So nowadays, every port probably has one container crane and is able to unload a container. Um, but not all ports will be large enough to, to reap the economies of scale from that. In order for, so our model would say in order to do that, you would need to invest land, poor country. So why, why do poor countries gain in, in, our, in our model? Well, we are uh, backing out the productivity and the amenities through kind of their, uh, their GDP and their population data. So what our model rationalizes is that they must have had a low productivity, which is low land rents, which is why they um, gain. So that's, I mean, it's the, that's the mechanism that we are talking about. So that's why. Okay. Thanks. But um, I think pretty much every port is able to kind of unload a container. <laughs> now it's just not necessarily everybody kind of at the same efficiency and cost. Yeah. But I, I mean, I think, I mean, it, it's a question of when, I mean, today they probably can, but there was a period when they probably all couldn't. Um, and, you know, there, there's this issue of like, you know, a lot of um, the shipping network is not really complete um, in the sense that not every place is visited by every ship always. Mm -hmm. And you might think that certain places would get bypassed um, and they, this tech, you know, if you don't adopt the technology, you're going to kind of, your trade costs go up. Yeah. Well, the bypassing would be here because um, we have economies of scale, right? So yeah. you would want to choose that port that um, also serves uh, other connections. Yeah. And if you call, want to call that bypassing, yes. But of course, the, but, we, but the port city in our model kind of takes that into account when deciding how much to invest. Right. So it's not that somebody imposes it on them. Uh, they would take into account, I mean, that's how the model works, right? I, the, I think this really just goes to like, you know, how quickly these guys can adopt and build the infrastructure, right? I mean, because so uh, in, in your world, it's instantaneous. You just, yeah. everyone reallocates. And yeah. I guess I have some idea that it might have been like, it might have taken some time. And so there would have been. Yeah, adjustments. no, I, I see that. I mean, the, like this, uh, the paper by Gisela Rua kind of stresses that this was a relatively quick um, adoption. Um, in, and our data is at each uh, decade, so it's a relatively long run. I think for that, if you had kind of annual data, I'm sure you would see like these uh, these these patterns. But it would happen maybe within 20 years, I think, according to her paper. Yeah, I, I would I would agree with George. There's certain American cities like Portland on the West Coast that were bypassed by the shipping lines. They are at mercy of what the shipping lines choose. And the cost of development in, in a place like Portland, they had to dredge to, to have sh uh, ship access 
uh, from the ocean. They have to dredge the river. Mm -hmm. uh, but they are at the mercy of the shipping lines. I agree with George. I mean, I can give a piece of anecdata for, for George's point, which is the Port of Santos in Brazil had significant container traffic before they ever had a gantry train. Like 20% of their break bulk was going through containers and they were just sort of manually taking them off the ships because the price of building the gantry trains was cranes were so high in Brazil and they were kind of a closed economy. So getting, getting it's internationally traded, but it, uh, Brazil had closed itself off to the world. So it wasn't traded. Mm -hmm. um, and so they waited a very long time before they actually containerized their port. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Even though the land was probably pretty cheap, <laughs> relatively speaking. That's right, yeah. I mean, yeah, of course, we are not explaining every story in every city of the world, right? Um, yeah. <laughs> I've heard lots of um, uh, stories about different um, cities, port cities sure. around the world. I, I appreciate this. I like these stories. Thank you for sharing them. <laughs> maybe, maybe in my next paper, I'm going to do something else. <laughs> Okay, cool. So uh, let's call this the official end of the seminar. George, if you want to stop.